The title of the series is The Return of Christ. The Return of Christ. Would you please say that out loud? The Return of Christ. Just say this, Jesus is coming back. Come on, slap your neighbor and say, He's coming back. And the subtitle today is Israel and the Third Temple. Israel and the Third Temple. So we want to talk about the return of Christ, and today we want to focus in on the nation of Israel and the Third Temple. I'm going to begin in Acts chapter 1, and I really want you to zero in on this today. I want you to throw yourself into the event. I want you to draw it up on your video screen. I want you to use your imagination as you read the text today, because this was a very, very real event, and it was extremely important for us as the church. Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, it says this, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, let me pause right there, because you have to remember that when the disciples uh, were following Christ, they were expecting the Messiah, but they were waiting for a geopolitical kingdom. Uh, They were wondering if Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. And Jesus kept telling them, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus kept saying, the kingdom is invisible. The kingdom is is of my Father. Uh, So he was talking about an invisible kingdom, and it took them a while to get their brains wrapped around that. I'm not even sure that they really fully understood it while he was uh, walking with them. So they come to him, they said, are are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, are you going to overthrow the Roman Empire? Are we going to go back to the glory days of of King David and King Solomon? Uh, And so this was their question. But he says to them in verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father had set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, this is an amazing promise because he says, hey, I I, I can't tell you. In fact, I don't even know when I'm coming back. Only the Father knows. Uh, But then he tells them, uh, he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to empower you because it's a preeminence that you promulgate the gospel and you advance the kingdom that is invisible and you get as many people saved as possible. Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now, I'm going to ask you again to throw your heart and your soul and your imagination into this event. It wasn't a story. I'm going to read it again. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Imagine that, just taken up into the heavens. Verse 10, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, watch this, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So the very way that he went into heaven, up into the sky, Jesus, we hear that he's coming back in the exact same way through the sky. He's coming back to earth. Someone say the return of Christ. Say the return of Christ. And so there's a lot that we can talk about with the return of Christ. Today we want to focus in on the nation of Israel and the third temple. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. And I shared with you that if you do any study on this and you read any scholars... Typically, we refer to this as the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse. This is because when Jesus begins to speak, he's doing it from the Mount of Olives. Thus, we call it the Olivet Discourse. So in Matthew chapter 24, this is in Jesus' own words what the end times are going to look like. Now, I said before, just to set this up for you, if you're interested in studying it, that the Olivet Discourse can be divided into three segments. So the first part is Jesus talks about signs that were near the end of the age. And this is what we talked about uh, the last time that I spoke on this, that that there are many signs happening right now uh, that were near the end. And then the second part of the Olivet Discourse is a period of great tribulation. And we're going to uh, be on the cusp of that today and begin to introduce that. And then the, the third part of the pericope 
is that it's the rapture and the return of Christ. Uh, so when you study the, the Olivet Discourse, it can really be divided into three uh, different segments. And I've given you the, uh, the, the scriptures there in Matthew 24. Now, I've mirrored it with Luke chapter 21. Because in, in Luke's rendition, uh, you can gain some insights uh, into the same event with slightly different wordings and slightly uh, different recollections of, of how the Lord said it. Uh, let, let me pause right there. Remember that when you read the Gospels, uh, that each person will describe an event, but they might describe it a little bit differently. If you were to go to a football game uh, today, or if you were to go to a soccer match, and we would both watch the same match, you would come back and you might retell it or recount it in one way. I might remember something slightly different from a different angle. Uh, so that's the power of the Gospels. We have four Gospels, so sometimes you have four events, and you got four different people describing the event and reconstructing the event. And you get powerful insights because one person might see something from one angle, another person might see something from a, another angle. And so that's the power of the Gospels. And, and when you read them, they're very harmonious uh, because uh, the Lord is describing the same event in slightly different ways. And so I put up Luke chapter 21 to mirror that if you're taking notes and if you're interested. Now, to review what we talked about last time, we said this. Uh, as we see the signs of the times, and we went through 10 uh, different signs of the times uh, from the first part of Matthew chapter 24. But we concluded with this. There are three things that we really need to do. We need to stand firm. Please say that out loud. Say, I got to stand firm. Okay, we have to stand firm. Uh, the second thing is we got to preach the gospel. Please say that. I got to preach the gospel. And the third thing is we got to keep living our daily lives. Uh, there might be a tendency to say, well, let's go up to the mountains and let's create our own town and get away from everybody because we see all the evil in the world. I, I understand that, but that's not what Jesus has called us to do. Jesus has called us to be salt and light and to live and to let our light shine and take as many people as we can to heaven as, as possible. That's the second one, which is to preach the gospel every opportunity. And we just indicated this, that throughout the book of Revelation, there are glimpses of revival where God just begins to move. So even in terrible suffering and difficult times, uh, there's a harvest that occurs. And so we have to be people that are wise, looking for the harvest, looking for the opportunity to share the gospel with an individual, to share the gospel where there are windows of revival happening that we will harvest uh, and take advantage of, uh, of those opportunities. And so we looked at these, these 10 signs. Now, let me, let me say this in, in review, uh, because there's really two things that, that surfaced when, when we talked about this. Uh, and it goes back to the very nature of the devil, the very nature of Satan. Uh, Jesus said it this way, that he is the father of lies. He's a liar. And one of the main things that we see right now in the world today, not just even in our nation, but in the world today, is that people are calling evil things good and good things evil. Uh, they are calling right things wrong and wrong things right. That's really important. Uh, so the devil is the father of lies. And so you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you. You've got truth on the inside of you. You've got Jesus, who is the way, the truth and the life, and you are set free by his truth, but you got to know his truth, uh, and so you discern. You discern when you hear something on the news, when you see something in society. You understand the lies of, of the enemy. The, the second thing that, that's really important to understand, when you look at all those 10 things, is your identity, because the enemy will always be attacking your identity. He's a liar, and he will try to destroy your identity, or the image of God. You know you were created in the image of God. And so, so the devil has always been trying to destroy the image of God or to mar and distort the image of God. I want you to think about this. If you go back to Egypt, uh, the devil was trying to kill babies. Uh, if you go back to the time of Jesus, he was trying to kill babies. He's trying to kill babies today uh, through this thing called, called abortion. So he's trying to destroy the multiplication or the replication of the image of God. Now, now think about how the image of God 
is reproduce. How do you reproduce the image of God? Well, you have this incredible power to create. You can create lives. And so through intimacy, through this incredible gift of expression called sexuality, uh, you've been given that gift to reproduce the image of God. No wonder the enemy is always trying to distort that, that place of intimacy, that place of sexuality, trying to distort it, trying to mar it, uh, trying to make it unbiblical. And so you can see an attack on the image of God where people are confused about their gender. They're confused about who God created them to be. I'm here to declare to you today, you got to fight for your identity and you got to fight for the identity of your children and your grandchildren say amen to that. And so we have to stand firm during these difficult and end times and say we will take a stand for truth and we will take a stand for what is biblical. Can you say amen? There's a lot I could say about all of that, but just in review, in review, <clears throat> we see the importance of standing firm, of preaching the gospel, and keeping our, living our daily lives and letting our lives shine. Now, let me begin this today. We're talking about the nation of Israel and the third temple. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of verses here in Matthew chapter 24, in verses 1 and 2, Jesus is walking with his disciples, and it says this, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. So draw that up on your video screen. They're walking along. They see the splendor of the temple. They see the splendor of all the buildings uh, that were built throughout the ages, and they're probably just talking about it. And then verse 2, Jesus comments, do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown away. So he very casually prophesies that the temple is going to be destroyed. <clears throat> he very casually prophesies that all of those buildings will be completely destroyed. And so then... If you drop down, now we read the, all these other verses, but I want to drop down to verse 15. Then he says this, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, and then it says this, let the reader understand. So Matthew is writing this, and it's so important. Normally as you read the Gospels, he's just quoting Jesus, but suddenly he pauses and he says, let the reader understand. In other words, he's saying this is really, really important. you got to hear what I'm writing to you. you got to hear what I'm saying. I'm recollecting. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting what Jesus said, but let the reader understand. And so he says, when you see the standing in the holy place, everyone say holy place, okay? And then he quotes the, the, the prophet Daniel. Now, he just said that in, in verse 2 that every stone would be, uh, would, that the temple would be destroyed, all these buildings, every stone that it would be completely destroyed. But yet in verse 15, he says, when you see standing in the holy place. So what that tells us is two things. One, that the temple was going to be destroyed, but secondly, it was going to be rebuilt. Because why would he say that in the holy place, when you see the holy place, if there was no temple? And so now, 2,000 years later, we can look back and we can begin to put the pieces Together Now, if they were living at the time, it, it might have been very, very confusing to them. Often when we're looking at current events, things might be a little bit confusing. Well, let me give you a little bit of history. The Jewish people revolted against the Roman Empire. So there was always a stirring that was going on, and the, the Roman Empire would squelch uh, different rebellions. But in 70 AD, uh, they revolted against the Roman Empire, and it was at that time that the temple and along with much of Jerusalem was destroyed. Rome, the, the might and the power of the Roman Empire, just decimated much of Jerusalem, and the temple was destroyed. Now, keep in mind, this was the second temple. The first temple was built under King Solomon. Uh, you remember that David made all the preparations, Solomon built the temple, and then they went into exile, and the temple was destroyed. When they came out of exile from Babylon, they went back, under the leadership of Nehemiah, who builds the wall, and then Ezra, who rebuilds the temple. Uh, that temple is rebuilt, and then Herod the Tetrarch, he added things to it. 
Uh, but that was the second temple at the time of Christ. Uh, still splendor, uh, built in all of its splendor. But that temple was completely decimated, completely destroyed. So Jesus' prophetic words came to pass exactly as he said. And so we know that. But in verse 15, suddenly he says, the holy place. So what's he talking about? Clearly indicates that there's going to be a third temple that's going to be built so that verse 15 can be fulfilled. And so if you look at the scriptures and if you go back to the Old Testament, you see Ezekiel, you'll see that, wow, there's a third temple that that is going to be built. Now, for the, the temple to be rebuilt, there had to be an Israel. But in 70 AD, during the revolt, after much of Jerusalem was decimated and the temple was, was destroyed, the Jewish people were scattered. It's what many scholars call the Jewish diaspora, or diaspora, however you uh, want to pronounce that. So they were dispersed all throughout the world. They were living. They had no home. There was no Israel. Think about that for almost 2,000 years. In fact, during World War II, you would wonder, uh, were, they going to be, were the Jewish people going to be completely destroyed with the, uh, with the, the, the murdering of over 6 million uh, Jews? But, but they had no home. Then a miracle takes place, and that's on May 14th, 1948, where Israel is reestablished then as a modern nation. Now, this is completely prophesied, okay? Ezekiel 36 and verse 24 says this, For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries, and bring you back into your own land. So way back, Ezekiel prophesied that they would be scattered, and then he prophesied that they would come back. And so the reestablishment of Israel as a modern nation in 1948 was prophetic. It's a fulfilling of prophecy. Uh, So so we know that in order for there to be a temple, there had to be a modern Israel. And so really that then gets the time clock ticking uh, because we see, wow, we have a a nation that's reestablished as Israel, the modern nation of Israel, which means then we can be in place for, for a temple. And so this was prophesied in Ezekiel. Now, what's really interesting is if you look at Samaria and you look at Judea and you look at Israel, it's all desert. There there is not much there. In fact, uh, yes, if you look back far enough into the text and in the scriptures, uh, the Lord said there would be a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, But if you were just going to pick a spot to say, let's create a nation, that probably wouldn't be it. Desert, just desert everywhere. But then Ezekiel also prophesied this in the exact same chapter a few verses later. He says, not only is the Lord going to gather them all back to Israel, but watch this. He says in verse 30 of Ezekiel 36, I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. And so the Jewish people were dispersed. They suffered disgrace. And when they came back to the nation of Israel, there was nothing there. (laughs) Excuse me, there was nothing there. It was all desert. But if you look at Israel today, it's an economic powerhouse. If you look at Israel today, the desert has been transformed. You really ought to do some research and just look at at some videos on that. It's been completely transformed from a desert into one of the most fertile places in the world. Uh, They were lacking water. Today they have a water surplus uh, and, and they've become an economic powerhouse. So I want to watch this next video because I, I want to give you just a little bit of a visual on the transformation of Israel. And there's so many things. It, it, it's, a, it, it's, a modern, uh, it's a modern nation. Tel Aviv is an economic powerhouse. But I just want to watch this video to show you a little bit of the transformation of how it went from a desert to... to to a surplus of water. Let's watch this. <coughs> it's easy to forget when you drive through Israel today that all these places that you're looking at that have green and vegetation and agriculture just a couple decades ago looked like this. They were barren, they were empty, they were completely dry, bone dry as we say. When I was a child growing up in Israel, 
We were constantly trained to conserve water. Don't take long showers. Don't let the hose run. Don't water the yard. There was a huge need to conserve water because there was such a scarcity of water in this land. You came into Makot in the time where Israel was coming out of a drought and heading into the next drought. That's right. One week after I got into the office, they established an investigation committee regarding the water problems in Israel. Because we didn't have enough water. Uh, yeah. The level of the water in the wells all over Israel was very low. It was really, really a serious situation then. It was when the desalination plant starting to be connected to the system, as we call it, the revolution of the water sector. Ido was the CEO of Mekorot when Israel began to seriously address its water crisis. Mekorot is Israel's national water company. It was founded in 1937, which means it existed even before Israel officially became a country. Since then, it's grown into a huge company with many branches and over 3,000 water installations throughout the country, all with the purpose of supplying water to the people of Israel. I met with David Balsar, who manages Mikot's Department of Innovations and Ventures, to discuss what is arguably Mikot's biggest achievement yet, turning seawater into drinking water. I guess this is one of the biggest achievements mm -hmm. of the Mikot and, and the state of Israel. We decided that drinking water mm -hmm. would come from the sea. It's an endless resource of water. We built five desalination plants across the Mediterranean Sea and one more in, uh, in Elat, in the Red Sea. And this provides more than 80% of uh, drinking water. It's very substantial. Yeah, so this enables us to detach ourselves from the dependence on, on climate. The second biggest achievement is agriculture. We are reusing 90% of our wastewater and turning them into high quality water for irrigation. Is that abnormal or is this something that's common around the world? Uh, that's, that's a world record. Behind us is probably Spain with 30%. I ask my people in Kohot, do you have the system? How to take all this huge amount of water from the sea and put them into Israel? In three months, we plan and design the new national water system of Israel. And that was one of the most important things. They had the vision to think ahead, many years ahead, and establish this spine. It goes across the whole of the state of Israel, carries water to every point in Israel. The relevance and importance of Israel's national water carrier is huge. David referred to it as a spine that goes across the whole country, and that's exactly what it is. It's essentially a huge water main, stretching across Israel from north to south, while the various stops along Israel's water infrastructure feed into it. This includes pumping stations, reservoirs, and now desalination plants. Being part of a government effort to do good is a unique privilege. Everywhere we look, like Jordan, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, if you go farther, Iraq, I mean, no one in the region has water. Mm -hmm. In Israel, we are now in a, in a water surplus. So that's, that's quite amazing. The innovation and the creativity and the faith of those first settlers and even the governments of Israel transformed the way this country looked. So things that used to look like this, are now full of agriculture. And today, just a couple generations later, me and my kids growing up here in the land, we're just living a different life. We no longer have to worry about water scarcity or water security in the land. The land has truly been transformed. That is nothing short of a modern day miracle in the land. So this is a living prophecy of what Ezekiel said, that it would be transformed from a desert uh, into fruitful, agriculture. So Israel is taking their techniques to places like Africa, to places like Ethiopia, the Sahara, teaching them now uh, how to manage water. And can you imagine how remarkable the desalination of water to take from the Mediterranean Sea and make it drinkable water? This is a living prophecy. And so, so Israel is flourishing, but it's also an economic powerhouse. They call Israel the startup nation. And so I want you to watch this short clip on the innovation and the technology of Israel. We've always lived with risk. There are people who are waking up today in the morning 
and all they want to do is destroy us, wipe us off the map. There are people who are arming themselves with nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, but that's all they want to do. That's real risk. But the risk of setting up a company, quitting my job and taking that risk to go build something new, to break rules and science, that's the kind of risk we do all the time. Our crowd is the world's largest equity crowdfunding platform that allows thousands, tens of thousands of individuals around the world to hook up to the best of technology investments, primarily Israeli companies. I've been a character in the birth of Startup Nation, which is what we call Israel's tech scene. And today there are thousands of startups in Israel that are changing the world that we live in. People who read the Bible understand that our function in this world is to bring the blessing of God into the world. If Israel was a slouch, if we didn't have these great companies, if we weren't changing the world, that would be surprising. Israel's on cancer. Israel's on how to make your web experience better. Israel's on education or concussion avoidance or all of these areas. So many great things that are happening here that are gonna help the world. We set up our credit about three years ago. We're now over $300 million invested both in the platform and into our company. Recently, we've sold two of our companies. One was a company called Replay, which was an immersive 360 degree sports that was sold to Intel and Crosswise was just bought by Oracle. So we're part of the story where American technology giants are essentially leaning on and sourcing their next innovations from Israel. Microsoft alone bought five Israeli companies. Oracle's bought three so far this year. And you go home and are proud about American technology, which is a wonderful thing. You have to understand that there is this partnership between America and Israel, where the great innovative advances forward for humankind are really getting done as a partnership of the US and Israel. Business people are doing God's work, in my opinion. We've unfortunately been hit with so much negativity about business and about business people being unethical and tycoons and stealing. And what people don't understand is God wants people to go out and create. It's not a, a fixed pie, which we simply have to fight over which piece we're gonna get. It's about how do we build this pie for all of mankind? How do we build Israel? How do we build the United States? How do we build all the countries, solve hunger? And in doing so, putting people to work, making money, letting investors join you. What a blessing. And so One of our you can see that the blessing of the Lord is on Israel. So it's reemerged. And that's why, folks, it's really important for us as individual believers to bless Israel, to pray for Israel. It's important for us as a nation to be aligned with Israel and to pray for Israel. So the first thing is the reemergence of Israel. Jesus is referring that the temple would be destroyed, but then suddenly he says the, the holy place. So Israel had to be there, and then he said and indicated and implied there's going to be a third temple. The second one's going to be destroyed, but the third one will be rebuilt. And so uh, the first and second temple were destroyed, but in the end times there's clearly a third temple. And this you can even see corroborated and substantiated in the book of Revelation, listen to Revelation 11, verse 1. Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. So as you see the clock ticking and you see the unfolding of Revelation, suddenly in Revelation 11, uh, there's a reference to the temple. There is a third temple uh, that is taking place. Now, let's go back to Daniel 24 and verse 15, and I'm I want to talk about this third temple. So in verse 15, Jesus says this. So when you see standing in the holy place, meaning there, there has to be a temple there, the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Now this abomination of desolation, what this means is that there's going to be a holy place, but then somebody is going to come in and desecrate the temple. Now, we don't have a lot of time to, 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 to talk about this. We're going to talk about this in later messages, but we'll just refer to it. What the book of Daniel, what Daniel was referring to, 
is he was talking about the Antichrist. He was talking about a dominating ruler. So I'm going to read to you uh, Daniel chapter 9.27, because this is what Jesus is referring to when he, when he says it in Matthew 24.15. He, and then I've inserted parenthetically because we know it from the context, he, a dominating ruler, will confirm with many for seven years. Uh, and I've inserted parenthetically. I don't have time to explain to you all of the, the reasons why we know it's seven years. In the middle of the seven years, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So the book of Daniel, and we'll get back to this, he talks about this dominating leader. He talks about what we often refer to as the Antichrist, that the Antichrist uh, will come in and he'll put an end to the sacrifice. Now pause right there. That means this, there has to be an Israel, there has to be a temple, and there has to be some sacrifices happening in order for the sacrifice to be stopped. That means this, there'll be a temple that's rebuilt and there'll be some sacrifices that'll be reinstituted because this dominating leader will put a stop to those sacrifices. Now we're beginning to get a bit of an understanding. Uh, let me help us a little bit by reading this out of the Living Bible, Daniel 9, 27. The king, this king, and then I've inserted parenthetically, ruler or leader, can be translated as king, ruler, or leader. This king will make a seven-year treaty with the people, but after half that time, he will break his pledge and stop the Jews from all their sacrifices and their offerings. Then, as a climax to all his terrible deeds, the enemy shall utterly defile the sanctuary of God. But in God's time and plan, his judgment will be poured out upon this evil one. Now, let me pause right there, and we don't have time to develop this, but those of you that have studied the end times and, and, and you're, uh, you have an awareness of it, he talks about this seven-year treaty. It's what we refer to as really the Great Tribulation. There is going to be a period of time, seven years of tribulation, uh, that is going to be absolutely horrific, uh, tremendous amount of suffering. Uh, and the temple is going to be rebuilt. There's going to be sacrifices. And then it says here, halfway through that time, this leader is going to put an end to the sacrifice. Uh, it's going to be the abomination of desolation. Now, in, in, in another message, we'll, we'll develop this a little bit, what that's going to, to look like uh, and how maybe those things are, are, are going to happen. But this is what I want us to focus in on today, is that there's a reemergence of Israel and there's actually a temple uh, that has been rebuilt. Now, there's a website, and I encourage you to go to it. It's called the Temple Institute. The Temple Institute was founded in 1987 by Rabbi Yisrael Ariel. Now, this guy was really interesting. He fought in the Six-Day War. If you're not familiar with the Six-Day War, uh, in 19, uh, I think it was 67, something like that, 68, uh, the nations that surrounded Israel, Syria, Egypt, different ones, the Arab nations attacked Israel in six days. And there's many accounts of supernatural uh, things that happened. Uh, the Israelis overthrew them and they just captured a whole swath of land. Now, one of the things that was interesting is that they took the Temple Mount uh, and so this rabbi, he was a paratrooper. He was part of the brigade uh, that liberated the temple, the temple mount. And so when they liberated the temple mount, these paratroopers and really all of Israel just assumed, wow, now we have the location of the temple and we can rebuild it. Inexplicably, Israel gave up the temple mount back to uh, under the control of Jordan and back, back to the Palestinians. And there was a massive swath of land, if you, look at, uh, if you look at it historically, that Israel had taken really that was more biblical uh, in its geography. But inexplicably, Israel gives it all back up, and now they're living on this just small slither of land. But this rabbi, who thought that they would rebuild the temple, 
at that point in time, but then Israel gives up control of it. He starts the Temple Institute in 1987. Now, here's what's important about, about the, the, the temple, the Temple Institute. This institute has been preparing all of the articles of the temple with painstaking detail, with biblical accuracy, uh, recreating every uh, uh, piece, uh, every article that was in the temple. They've been recreating it, and they're, they're ready uh, to rebuild the temple. So they're getting everything uh, ready, down to the garments of the priest. Uh, down to the menorah, down to uh, just exactly how the Bible described to, to make all the articles. Now, here's the fascinating thing. The Temple Institute says they know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Interesting. That would be amazing if they actually knew where it was and they, when they rebuilt the temple that they brought the Ark of the Covenant back. Now, there's something that you ought to watch for And we're going to watch this little clip uh, because in order for sacrifices to be reinstituted, they have to start uh, producing heifers. And very specifically, and you'll see this scripture in a moment, in Leviticus, they need to be red heifers. And so I want you to watch this news clip here. The five red heifers are now in a secure, undisclosed location in Israel. Plans include moving them sometime soon to a visitor's center in Shiloh, where the tabernacle of the Lord once stood for nearly 400 years. The book of Numbers explains that ashes of the red heifer are used to purify priests for their service in the temple. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. Its offal shall be burned, for the water of purification it is for purifying from sin. These red heifers are now between one and a half to two years old. To replicate the ceremony mentioned in the Bible, they need to be at least three years old. And within that time span, they cannot have a blemish or anything that would disqualify them for the ceremony, even one white or black hair. According to those working on the project, the ceremony of the red heifer needs to be performed on the Mount of Olives and in a place that would have looked directly into where the temple stood. The land I'm standing on, bought 12 years ago, fits both of those standards. It's had to be exactly at the front of place that the priest that made this ceremony can see the holy of the holy place. Rabbi Yitzhak Mamo owns the land here on the Mount of Olives. And we hope that in a year and a half from today, we can make here in this area the ceremony of the red heifer that actually will be the first step to the temple. Mamo says the ceremony needs priests who have not been defiled by touching anything dead. The Temple Institute actually have uh, nine pure priests. They didn't born in a hospital, okay, they born at home. Mm-hmm. Because they are priests, so anyway, they don't go to any cemetery. Mm-hmm. And the parents keep them in a situation that they will not get to any cemetery, not going to mm-hmm. other, any uh, problematic place, and they are pure, mm-hmm. and they are waiting. Wait. So we have the priest, we have the red heifer, we have the land, and we have everything ready. We just need to wait another one and a half year. So we believe that uh, it's very likely that the ceremony would happen somewhere in the area of Passover 2024, out to possibility of Shaviot 2024, somewhere in that timeline, the cows would be old enough and it would be the proper timeline for that ceremony. Byron Stinson of Bonnet, Israel, helped find the red heifers in the U.S. He says these would be the first in 2,000 years and that the process toward a third Jewish temple began when the Jewish people started their return to the promised land from the four corners of the world, culminating with Israel becoming a nation. And then in 1948, in one day, they were reborn as a nation and nobody said that could happen. And then you move forward and Israel continues to be this strong nation and all of these prophecies start fulfilling. There's so many now have been fulfilled. It's just incredible 
the evidence of, of what God is doing with uh, Jerusalem as the center of that. And the temple is the center of Jerusalem. And so how can it happen and how will it happen? I don't think anyone really knows for sure. Stinson believes the temple is meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. You know, in the Bible, it says when Solomon built the first temple, he said, this is a house of worship for all nations. That's what the temple is. And I think a lot of people think it's just a Jewish temple, but that's not true. It's for all the nations of the earth. Stinson says they plan to invite everyone to the red heifer ceremony that may take place in Passover 2024. Everything is in place now with the red heifers. As long as they stay pure, one of them stays pure, then we have everything in place, including the priests. Mamo says, according to the Jewish sage Maimonides, there were nine red heifers from Moses to the second temple. It's not his way to write, but suddenly he said, the tent will make the Messiah. We know that the Messiah will make the tent. Maybe we have the privilege to be one of these people that uh, help the Messiah to do it. So we're waiting. And so Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem. So these guys are ready to build the temple. They're ready to reinstitute the sacrifices. And it is remarkable, uh, the timeline that we're right in the middle of. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, how can the temple re be rebuilt? Because uh, of the Temple Mount, the location, what's sitting on that today is a mosque. And so I want to put these pictures up uh, because this would be the scenario then uh, that we would think about if we uh, were to see the rebuilding of the temple. How, how, would that even, how would that even happen? Well, I think there'd have to be a war that would actually take place. And so this is what's sitting on the Temple Mount right now uh, is this mosque. Let's go through these pictures and I want to uh, just say uh, that this is the location of it. And so most of you are familiar with the Wailing Wall where the Jewish people go and they pray uh, because they want to have the Temple Mount back so that they can, they can rebuild. Uh, let's go to the next picture. So how could this happen? Uh, well, one scenario would be that the, that mosque is destroyed and they rebuild that temple right there. If that were to happen, there would be a major war that probably would take place. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, because if this were to, to happen, uh, the, there, there would be a major conflict. And so we're watching uh, this all the time. Let's go to the next uh, picture. Here would be another scenario that somehow there would be peace that would be struck. And you've got the, uh, the mosque on one side with the, the temple right next to it. That actually might be quite plausible based on the scripture that there'd be some leader that would strike a peaceful deal and then the temple could be built. Uh, but then he goes in and there's an abomination of, of desolation where they desecrate it. Uh, so this is what the rendering of Solomon's temple and what they say Solomon's temple looked like and then the rebuilding of that under, uh, under Ezra and then the additions by Herod. Uh, let's go to the next one. This was just a, a rendition that somebody thought of, uh, would this be the temple uh, right next to the, uh, right next to the, the mosque? Uh, it would have more of a modern look to it. And our final picture here, uh, these are some of the renditions of what would the third millennium, what would this third temple look like? Would it be extremely modern or would it have a nod back to, to the historical architecture? So this is remarkable because we're living in a day and age where Israel was reestablished, which got the clock ticking. Now we're seeing that the Temple Institute is ready to start reinstituting sacrifices in a moment in time. They even claim that they know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But either way, uh, if the temple is rebuilt, they can start reinstituting uh, the sacrifices. And so we see the reemergence of Israel. We see... Uh, the temple. This is incredible, the moment of time that we're living in, which means that we're getting very close to the return of Christ. Someone say the return of Christ. So in closing, how do we respond? What's our response? Uh, look at Matthew 24 and verse 42. Jesus said this, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. 
you got to keep watch. Everyone say, i got to keep watch. Folks, it, it would behoove you to pay attention to some of these things that are happening. It would behoove you to, to pay attention to things that are happening biblically and to mirror that with current events. Uh, God tells us, Jesus said in his word, to keep watch. That's what we must do. Look at verse 43. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So number one, you got to keep watch. Say that, i got to keep watch. But secondly, you got to be ready. Say that, I'm, i got to be ready. Okay. Now, for those that love the Lord... For those that are ready, he comes as king, and he comes as a bridegroom. But if you're not ready, he comes as a thief. It's an interesting metaphor that is a bit surprising that Jesus would use it, but if you think of it in terms like this, that he comes like a a, a thief. In other words, there's there's an element of surprise. There's there's an element of suddenness. Uh, If he's your friend, he's coming as king. He's coming as bridegroom. If you're not ready, it's like a thief. It's like you're surprised. It's like, oh, what, what's going on? My life's all uh, getting, getting turned upside side down. Listen to Revelation 16, verse 15. And this is in the red. Jesus is saying it. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake. Blessed is he who stays awake. So again, to reiterate, if you're ready, he's coming like a bridegroom. He's coming as your King, if you're not ready, he's coming like a thief. Uh, You'll be surprised. So you need to keep watch, and you need to keep ready. You need to be ready. Uh, And so these are important times, my brother and sister, as we're watching current events. But our hearts, we need to be ready, and we need to continue to watch these things. Now, let let me refer back to my last message. What do we do? We preach the gospel. Every opportunity, every window of revival, we're there to harvest it. Every opportunity we're sharing with people, we're taking as many people as we can to heaven. And we're providing peace and stability in a chaotic world because we have the answer. Say amen to that. Let's stand to our feet today. Let's stand to our feet.